Last week we looked at part one and one of the things that I was explaining is that uh, I have an iPhone 6S and uh, I, I recently upgraded to uh, iOS 11 and my phone started to slow down and uh, we went through and we, uh, I tried to explain that uh, when you put new software in an old phone, it's an issue. Uh, Apple has come out and, uh, and apologized and said that um, when you uh, are upgrading to this new software, sometimes your battery, it starts to wear down. And so they've made this apology to, to everybody for, for this. And, and uh, we looked at the text where Jesus uh, gives a similar, similar analogy uh, about how it, when you put... Uh, new wine in old wineskins, it creates a problem. I also uh, gave the illustration of New Year's resolutions, and I said many of us have issues with these New Year's resolutions because we are uh, giving New Year's resolutions, but we still have these old habits. So New Year's resolutions, but old habits, new software, old iPhone, and this was the text that uh, we, we looked at last week. No, I need to switch this on. And we look from Mark chapter 2. And Mark chapter 2, uh, it began from verse 18 and said, uh, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered and said, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time has come when the bridegroom will be taken away. And on that day, they will fast. And here comes the two uh, short analogies or parables that Jesus gives and says, no one sews uh, a piece of, uh, of new cloth, untrodden cloth, on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskin. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the new wine, wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. Basically, Jesus is saying, I have these new concepts, these new ideas, but sometimes our old traditions don't allow us to accept these new ideas that I'm bringing you. And we, we, we spoke about, um, we have these New Year's resolutions, but our old habits are stopping us. And here's the lessons that we learned from an iPhone. We said, if you're going to speed up your iPhone, uh, here are some of the things that you can do if you have an old phone and you're putting new software on it. Number one, you clear your browser history. We looked at and said there are certain things, you have like these caches, and so when you put a, an, a, an old website in or you mistakenly put an old website in, it's going to prompt you to go back to that website. We said for this new year, forget about the places you have been in the past. Forget about the things that you have done in the past and focus on the new things. So clear your browser history. We talk, spoke about turning off background apps. There are multiple apps. If you don't close them, they will continue to run at, in the background of your phone. Uh, and we said, listen, close those ones down. Focus on one New Year's resolution. Just focus on one and perfect that. We said oh, it takes 66 days to form a habit. And we said that there are certain things that we have in our life. There are certain friends that we have. There are certain uh, things that we're doing that we just need to remove from our life. Uh, uh, or, uh, just focus on that one one. Make space. Delete unwanted apps. That's what I was talking about. Uh, we need to make space. Uh, there are things that we have going on in our life that shouldn't be going on. Remove them. And then we said change the battery. Apple have said you can come in and for a reduced fee they will change the battery to give you a, your phone a new lease of life. Uh, and we said, listen, the Bible says, create in me a new heart, O oh God. Uh, be restored by the renewing of your mind. So last week, we really focused on the individual. We focused on us, what we need to do, what lessons we can learn from the iPhone. This week, I want us to focus on the church. We're going to be looking at the church. What lessons can we as a church learn from the iPhone? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, it's your time now. 
Speak through me, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Does anybody know who this is? Oh, 10 gold stars. This is Martin Cooper. He is the, uh, 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 the engineer that made the, the, the first cell phone. Okay, he worked for Motorola. This was in April 3, 1973. And I love Martin Cooper because he made the first mobile phone call to his competitor. He called a fellow telecommunication company and he phoned them and he said, listen, uh, hi guys, listen, I, I just want to know, let you know that I'm, I'm phoning you uh, from my mobile. Yeah? Ma Martin Cooper was the first guy to uh, invent the, the, the mobile phone. And uh, the mobile phone that he is holding is that said phone. It weighed 1.1 kilograms. In order to get 30 minutes of talk time, you would need to charge it for 10 hours. And it would make a dent in your bank account to the tune of $4,000 or 260, I mean, two, uh, in or 2,639 pounds. This was a breakthrough in technology. How many of us had this phone? It wasn't until this phone that the consumers really started to have this. In uh, 1993, uh, this is the Motorola one-to-one. -one. Now, I remember my dad having this phone, and, and the SIM card for this phone was the size of a credit card. And, and, and the, the, the amazing thing about this phone is that you could have free calls after seven. After seven o'clock, you could phone landlines, and, and it was free. And, and so this was one of the, the, the biggest phones that uh, all consumers started to have. But it wasn't until 1997 that I became the owner of my own phone. This was the first phone that I had. This is what I called the banana phone, or, or people called the banana phone. And I, I love this phone even more because it was featured in The Matrix. Ah. Oh. So I would walk around and I would try to flick the phone so it slid out. And, and I love this phone. And there was one feature that this phone had. It had a game on it called Snake. Guys, remember Snake? Oh, snake, man. This, 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 was, this, was, this was revolutionary. Everyone just playing snake on the bus. And <laughs> it, it was, it was, but here's the interesting thing. This is not a Motorola. This is a Nokia. And Nokia became the market leader in mobile telecommunication from 1998. And it held that position for over a decade. Nokia sold over 250 million Nokia devices, making it the best-selling electrical gadget in history. Nokia was the market leader. Who remembers this phone? This was the face-off. This was uh, excellent because what you could do is you could have one phone, but you could change the color of the face. And so now, you know what? I'm wearing blue today, so I have a blue face. But then tomorrow, I might be wearing red, so I just click on a red face. And so now my phone color coordinates with me. This was fantastic. And as technology began to grow, there were various other things that were introduced. Infrared. Who remembers infrared? With infrared came Snake 2. Oh, guys, you're not as excited as me. Snake 2, you could play with your friend via infrared. And you could try and eat as many dots before them. And, so, and, 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 and now, I, if I wanted to give you my phone number, I didn't have to tell you my phone number. I could send it via infrared. And this was like new technology, and everyone's like, whoa, infrared. But then you came Bluetooth as well. But then came a new player into the market. And this new player was BlackBerry. 
Now, BlackBerry changed the game a little bit because now uh, everybody started to have emails instantaneously. I remember I was working with IT when we started to roll out all of these BlackBerry. This was the BlackBerry Pearl. This was a later edition, and, and it had a color screen. Before that, it was just that blue and white kind of screen. Um, but this was BlackBerry. It was bringing all these things in, and one of the things that BlackBerry did is it brought in BlackBerry Messenger. BlackBerry, BlackBerry Messenger enabled you to communicate uh, kind of, it was like the very first version of WhatsApp kind of thing. So BlackBerry was also changing the game. But it wasn't until 2007 that the mobile phone game changed forever. And that's with the iPhone. When the iPhone was launched in January 9, 2007 and released for sale in January 29, 2007, it changed the way we would do mobile phoning forever. It introduced full internet on your phone. Before we were using kind of WAP. Who remembers WAP? WAP was just little pages. It was very slow. It wasn't that great. But uh, the iPhone brought full internet to your phone. It also brought you a customizable phone because you would decide the applications that you put on your phone. But not just that. It took away the hardware keyboard and introduced a software keyboard, giving you a bigger screen. Apple changed the game. It's what we call a first mover. Now watch this. First movers are always in the forefront of marketing experimenting with the newest technologies and innovations. They are characterized by their affinity to experimentation, risk-taking, and can-do attitude. Notice something. iPhone has come along with this revolutionary new phone Nokia is still the market leader. Nokia, sitting on high, said, uh, we are the market leader. We, we don't need to change. These guys are coming in there. They're introducing something, but it's, it's, it's not that good. We're, we're, we're not going to follow them. How many of us in here have Nokias now? Three, four. That's how far they have fallen. Because if I asked you that question in 2000, the flip would be said. Most of us would have it. When iPhone introduced this new technology, Nokia did not move with them. And because they did not move with them, they got left behind. This has happened with other companies. Blockbuster. Who remembers Blockbuster Video? There was a time where if you wanted to watch a film in your home, you had to go to Blockbuster. But then Netflix came along. Apple TV, streaming. I don't need to go to Blockbuster. Blockbuster would have known about this when the first mover came in. But once again, I sit on my mountaintop, I have cornered the market, and Blockbuster refused to move with technology. Where is Blockbuster now? Gone. Kodak. Didn't follow with the digital stream. Even now, people are talking about the high street. Do we still need a high street? If you have a high street shop, you have to have an online profile in order to keep up with momentum. Here's the interesting thing. First movers. When I look at the church, when I was 10, the church looked a certain way. I would walk into church, someone would hand me a piece of paper with a bulletin on it, 
with the program. I would walk into church. I would stand up to sing a hymn. I would sit down, and then I would stand up again for the prayer. I would sit down. Then we would have the, 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 the tithes and offering. Then we would have a sermon, and we would go home. Fast forward... I come into church, someone hands me a piece of paper, it has the program on it, I come into church, I stand up for the, the song, I sit down, and then I stand up again, and I sit down, and then we have a sermon, and we go home. The church has not changed. We are doing the same things that we were doing 60 years ago. But when you look at the world around us, Everything has changed. Society has changed monumentally. Why has the church not changed? And here's another interesting fact. We lose one out of every three people that we baptize. One out of three. One out of three. For every three people that we baptized, one will leave but we're still doing the same model of church. We still have the same model where one out of three leaves. We're still doing the same model where one out of three leaves. We are not moving with the times. Now, let me be clear. I am not saying that we change our theology. Because our message is a fantastic message. Our message says, oh, oh, let, me, let me say this. Pastor Fuller, who I got this whole concept from, Pastor Anthony Fuller, he says this. We are doing Motorola church in an iPhone generation. We still are doing a Motorola church in an iPhone generation. Pastor Anthony Fuller. I'm not saying we change our message because our message is sound. Our message is solid. Our message says there is a God who loves you so much that even though an adversary has come in and messed up his initial plan for you, that he wants you to uh, be in loving harmony with him, but this adversary has come and messed up all of that. He sent his son to die for us so that we can live the life that he always intended for us. That's the gospel. God loves us this much that he sent his son so that whoever believes in him doesn't perish. Our message doesn't change. Why? Because God does not change. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, I am Yahweh, I am God, and I change not. So we don't change our message. The principles that we find in the Bible don't change. But the way we apply them does change. Let me give you an illustration. Exodus chapter 3, Moses, he's left uh, Egypt, he's been exiled, and he's gone uh, into the deserts of Midian, and he is uh, uh, tending sheep, and he sees this phenomenon. He sees this uh, uh, bush that is burning, but uh, when something is burning, it starts to be consumed. It starts to uh, uh, kind of wither, but this bush is not being consumed. It's on fire, but it is not being consumed by the fire. It's a, it's a strange phenomenon, and, and Moses starts to walk towards this tree, uh, uh, but there is the voice of God that arrests him and says, uh, Moses, stop. Stop. Take off your shoes, because the place you have is ha holy ground. Moses takes off his shoes. What's the principle? The principle is reverence to God. Which surprises me because I notice that everybody is wearing their shoes. So we have a principle which says reverence to God. Now how do we apply it within our cultural context? Well, do you know what? 
If we want to show reverence to God, what do we do? When we come into church, we keep silent when somebody is up here talking. That's how we show reverence to God. We switch off our mobiles when we come into church because that's how we show reverence to God. That would never be in the Bible because there were no phones in the Bible. But this is why the Bible is applicable to all generations because we take the principles and apply them into our own context. We don't change the principles. Why? Because we serve a God that does not change. Now, there are some principles that are applicable and they're the same application throughout all generations. Do not steal. Don't steal in 20 BC. Don't steal now. It's the same application. But there are principles where the application will change, and we just saw one of them through Moses. So as a church, we're still doing Motorola Church in an iPhone generation. Uh, uh, How do we move forward? Listen to this quote I found. Author is Ellen White. And she says this. The use of... Object lessons, blackboards. This is, she's writing to her time. So she's saying, guys, blackboards, whoa, this is new technology, blackboard, whoa. Now with blackboard, yeah? Maps and pictures will be an aid in explaining these lessons and fixing them in the memory. Parents and teachers should constantly seek for improved methods. The teaching of the Bible should have our freshest thoughts and our best methods and our most earnest efforts. We're still using the methods of 70 years ago. That's not fresh. And the interesting thing is when you look at this uh, new wine into old wineskins, I started a church plant in my early years of ministry. We went out into the community. We rented a a community hall in South London. And we was going into the community and we was, you know, people were coming in. And we did the bog standard church model. Church starts 9.30, you know, second service, 11.15. and, and, And one of the things that we realized was this. Nobody was coming at 9.30. The Adventist people were coming. But the people from the community, they weren't coming. Because most people on a Friday night after work, they go down the pub with their friends, you know, for a little drink. Nobody wants to wake up at 8.30 in the morning to go church. So we said, well, you know, if nobody's coming at 9.30, let's change the time to 11.30 and let's do Sabbath school. Ooh, big mistake. Because... The old wineskins, the traditional mind. Uh, uh, guys, as Adventists, we start church at 9.30. You can't change the model because this is, this, is the way, this is what makes us Adventist. And Guys, you have to start thinking outside of the box. So I changed the time to 11.30 and the community started to come. But then I realized something that nobody had a Sabbath school lesson. So we're studying the Sabbath school lesson, but nobody had a Sabbath school lesson. So... What we did, we said, we're not going to study a Sabbath school lesson. Let's just do a Bible study. Oh, no, this, this is even more controversy. Uh, this, uh, my church plant is now being looked at as, as, as a breakaway group because we are moving away from Adventist standards, Adventist traditions. And I'll never forget that. But we are called to, to look at new ways to use uh, the freshest ideas, the freshest thoughts, to look at our methodology. Not the fundamentals. Our fundamentals are solid. They're sound. Don't need to change the message. You need to change the method. Greater light shines upon us than that shone upon our fathers. We cannot be accepted or honored of God in rendering the same service or doing the same works that our fathers did. 
In order to be accepted and blessed of God as they were, we must initiate their faithfulness and their zeal, improve our light as they improve theirs, and do as they would have done and they would have lived in our day. We must walk in the light which shines upon us, otherwise the light will become darkness. We have so much information. But all we're doing is the same thing that our fathers did. We need to start doing church in a way that is applicable to those that need to hear it. So, what lessons can we learn from our iPhone as a church? Lesson number one. Don't be afraid to try new things. I find that as a church, sometimes we're just, we're, we're, we're literally our old wineskins. We, 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 this is the way it's always been done. And what we do is we say it's done like this because of the Bible has told us to do it this way. And so uh, our traditions become grounded in uh, some sort of theology. And so we cannot change from that model. That's not true. Don't be afraid to try new things. The iPhone was a first mover. Now watch this. Many of you will not know this, but the iPhone was not the first phone that Apple produced. In 2006, uh, Apple was flying high on the success of the iPod. Can you remember the iPod? Steve Jobs, many regard him as a genius. I actually think he is a genius as well. Uh, I, I read his autobiography and he said, listen, uh, sooner or later, somebody is going to figure out that the iPod, it, it, it will be null and void because people carry phones. And as soon as somebody puts the iPod in a phone, then nobody needs an iPod anymore. And so he said, and he did something that he swore he was never going to do. He partnered with Motorola to produce a phone called the Rocker. The Rocker was Apple's first phone that they did with Motorola, and it was an epic failure. Technology Magazine said, is this supposed to be the phone of the future? He tried something new and it didn't work, but he did not give up. Don't be afraid to try new things. First movers are risk takers. That's why they're first movers. It's never been done before. As a church, we need to be looking at things that have not been done before. Let's not think within the box, let's think outside of the box. How can we take our product, our message, and share it with the world. Two, always consider the user experience. Apple is huge on this. From the packaging that you buy, when you uh, buy any Apple product and you, you open it, they, they want you to have an experience. And so everything is done in white, it's nice, it's shiny and all of this stuff. Consider the user experience. Do we consider the user experience? When people that do not come to church, coming to church, are they experiencing the message that we are trying to tell them? Because you are the church. The Bible says this. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Picture a church where everybody in that building has genuine love for one another. They go out of their way to greet each other. They talk to each other during the week. They know each other's families. They know each other's names and, and, and faces, and they recognize. And there is just this genuine feeling of love. Can you imagine that? Do you know what? That's a church that I'd like to go to. Because we all crave community. We all crave love. And so if there is a church 
where people come in and they feel genuine love, then we are not just preaching a gospel, we are living it. People are experiencing the message that we are trying to tell them. And the final one. Create a product that they want. They just don't know they want it. When the iPhone came out, who bought it? This is the first generation iPhone. Who bought it? Wow. Nobody. I didn't buy it. And the reason I didn't buy it is because I had a Blackberry. And when they brought out this iPhone, I refused to accept because I, I, I didn't want a phone that did not have a hardware keyboard. I, I wanted the keyboard. I like the feel of the buttons under my fingers because I can type and, and know where the keys are. And so I was like, I'm not buying that silly phone. Steve Jobs created a product that everybody wanted, but nobody knew that they wanted it. There are very few phones now that you can buy with a hard-wired keyboard. Most of them are all touchscreens, following off of this model of the first mover. And understand this, uh, when you have this first mover, you either move with them or you die out. Create a product that they want, that they just don't know they want it. Here's the, here's the beautiful thing. We already have that product. We don't need to create it. That product is Jesus. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. People don't want Jesus because they have not tasted him. They have not experienced him. When you experience Jesus, when you taste what he has to offer to your life, it is life-changing. It's something that everybody wants in their life. They just don't know it. And so we search after other things when really what we want is Jesus. So we have a product that they want. They just don't know that they want it. Now we need to let them know it. How do we do that? Well, because I want this church to be a first mover, I don't actually know. It hasn't been done. We have to try new things. We have to look at different methodologies of getting our message out. Here's one suggestion. One, well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more on behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that I can preach. We're all part of families. And here is the thing. The church is not this building. We've got that concept kind of messed up. Oh, we're going to church. No, you're bringing church with you because you are the church. And if you as a family unit practice what you preach, you will do more for Christianity than anybody that stands up on this pulpit. Let's take the church outside the walls. Radical concept. Not really, because Jesus did it. Let's stop focusing on this building as the church. Let's take our gospel message out. Let's live according to the word. When we do that, you do more for the gospel than I can do. That's powerful. That's powerful. So here it is. Here's my appeal. Number one. If you are hearing about this gospel for the first time, you've never been to church before or you've just been to church, but this is the first time you're hearing about this, this Jesus that loves you, that died for you, and you want to experience what I've been talking about, if you're sitting next to a family member or somebody that you know, just squeeze their hand. Just squeeze their hand. 
Because then it's that family's responsibility to, to then take that further now. I, 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 it's not my responsibility, it's the church's responsibility. It's your responsibility to now uh, 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 help that person to understand Christ more. What I can do is I can give you resources, I can give you, uh, I, I can even Bible study with you, I can help you on that journey, but you as a family, you start that journey and take that person on that process. If somebody wants to know more about Jesus, just squeeze somebody's hand. And as a church, we're going to move you on that journey. And my second appeal is this. For us as a church, someone once said, if you want to be a water walker, you have to step out of the boat. If you want to walk on water, you have to step out of the boat. You have to take that leap of faith to try new things that some may say are impossible. But as a church, let's commit that this year we're going to be first movers, that we're going to try new things, that we're not going to be stuck in the old ways of the past. Let's try be different. Our message is the same, but we can just do it in different ways. If you want to make that commitment today, I'm going to ask you to stand as we pray. That we're not going to be stuck to the traditional ways of doing things. That we're going to think outside the box. All of us are going to get involved in something. Let's look at different ways of doing the same gospel. Lessons from an iPhone. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven. This is the word I had, Lord. Uh, I pray that it is one that we as a church take on wholeheartedly. We're losing one in three. But dear Father, your message is so good. It's like we're doing it in injustice. Please help us to help everybody else around us to taste and see that you are good. Because what you have to offer is life-changing. Be of us, bless us in a special way, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.